Um, I'm going to talk about Couchbase. First of all, I'm not affiliated or anything with Couchbase. I'm just a developer who likes that stuff. So uh, if I do anything wrong here, correct me or something. But um, and it's the first time I do talk about Couchbase. So uh, yeah, I hope everything is correct and everything works. Uh, short introduction about me. Um, lots of titles. So I'm an MSc in computer technology and PhD in computer science. Uh, certified software engineer. I love working with Node.js, I love Apple products and more SQL products. I uh, do a lot of sports, love Barcelona. So I'm here since a year. And I do it since two years I'm working with CouchDB and um, CouchBase. Uh, I started basically with the CouchDB. Like the, the first thing when you go to know SQL is like CouchDB or MongoDB. <coughs> What's, what do you choose? Um, many people choose MongoDB because it's more more like as uh, it's more formal, there more rules, and yeah, it has more like strictness in it. Um, I chose Couchbase or CouchDB because it was available on mobile, so I can sync, or I, I, I was able to sync the CouchDB directly from the net to my mobile device, and the other way around. So um, the first app was an iPad app I wrote with mobile couch sync um, for, for a history project like transcription of ancient historic documents and letters. Um, so basically download an image of a, of a letter and you transcribe this image and you store everything in CouchDB and the CouchDB gets sent with an online database and distributed to all devices. Um, so that was my first project and I'll tell you more later uh, other things that I've done with Couchbase and CouchDB so you can know with you what's, what you can do actually with it. Today we're going to talk about an introduction to code space and telling you a bit about document design, best practices in document design. Uh, we go a bit into map reduce, like how to write views, a bit into memcaching, a couple of use cases and QA. Um, what we're not going to do today is custom design, deployment, security, advanced document design, buckets, v buckets, all that stuff, spatial stuff, spatial views, like how to do geolocation-based uh, queries, all that stuff. Um, we have a Couchbase group since last week, or since, I think two days ago I put it on Meetup. Um, the first Meetup is going to be September 24, so if you want to know more about especially geospatial views and all that stuff, uh, we're going to follow up on that with the Couchbase uh, group Barcelona. So what's Couchbase? Couchbase is an OSQL server. And it basically has two components, like when you, when you set up a Couchbase server, it asks you <coughs> if you want to use CouchDB or LangCache to That's the first decision you're going to take when you set up a new server. Um, if you don't have any clue, CouchDB is usually pre-selected. Um, it's CouchDB stores JSON documents. It's a JSON store. And it has indexing and querying and that can So it's basically everything that CouchDB has, plus a couple of extras in the Couchbase server. Uh, the second option is memcached key, that's basically um, a pure key value store in memory, so it's super fast key value store. As written here, I, was, I just took this data from, from the product information, so it's seven millisecond latency, uh, sounds pretty fancy, so they do a lot of operations within a couple of seconds, and you can easily distribute it. That's the same for CouchDB as well, distribution and uh, scalability are some two really big buzzwords for knowledge well because it's super easy to do. Both of these have the outer sharding, which means you can just click on a new server and automatically it gets distributed to the other server and you're all paying over and everything. And you can just add another server with, with as much RAM as you need if you, if you start a service, for example. And you see there's a peak coming in of user signups because you've got Featured or on TechCon or something, and you really, you really need more capacity right now, just for a couple of hours to get that to get over that peak. If you have your server running on Amazon, um, you just click Add a New Server, it automatically balances within a couple of seconds, and you have twice the twice the capacity. Um, replication auto failover, as I, what I just explained, it automatically switches um, some parts of the database distributed to a the servers. Um, so usually when you start with CouchDB, you start with two nodes. So um, one 
every node has basically the full content, but it always tries to get it from both nodes. So one is one half is always failover, the other half is content. So it takes fifty percent of node one and fifty percent of node two. That's the working space, the working data, and the other fifty percent of both machines are failover data, which is basically just a redundant uh, copy from, from the other node. Big question. There's Oracle, there's MySQL, everybody knows MySQL, everybody develops PHP, MySQL. Uh, why should I use MySQL? Because of the, everybody has seen those who use in MySQL, right? And it's a SQL development. I'm sick of it. I did 10 years of SQL, and I'm <coughs> sick of these things. I don't want to see them anymore. It's like database documents are horrible, like all these links on this relational data, it's out of control, in my opinion. So for NoSQL, you don't need a schema. You have interactive, interactive database engineering, so you start basically with a small stuff. So when you start a new project, um, you need the user data. You need a user data. So you start with users. The data you need, you need for users, you write down username, password, that's enough for the beginning. If you need some data later, you just add it gradually, organically to the document. And it doesn't matter for the rest of the data. You can just add it as well or just leave it out. It doesn't matter. If you, if you start with an SQL database, you have to like, spend days of thinking, like, how should the table be? What, what data will I need? What data will I need in the future? What data will I need in a year? Because I can't change it later anymore. Changing a database table, if, if there is a lot of data inside, it's Portable. Um, and it's more related to documents and, and objects, to like real world stuff. Um, there are definitely things that you can't do or shouldn't do in all scale databases. Like everything that is naturally relational, um, forget, forget now as well. Stick with MySQL or Oracle solutions um, because relations are kind of hard to replicate. This is more about um, like simple relations, one to one, one to many, and documents that are kind of real world documents or objects like persons, cars, everything that you have from, from object oriented programming can be replicated in a OSGRA. Let's start first with the first option that you can start when, when using Couchbase. That's the CouchDB part. Um, it's an information storage. Like we store JSON documents. I'll explain that later. Oh, if you have any questions or something you want to ask, or anything, just interrupt me and raise your hand or something. Uh, document based information. We store documents. That's the basic, the principal idea of how should we store documents. What do these documents look like? That's a document. So we have a city document here. I made this up. The software names that you have, uh, Python, the uh, state, tagline, population, tags, couple of startups in Barcelona. Um, what does it mean? So we have basically what JSON is, is key value. So there's always key value, key value. The value can be a string, a number, any kind of number, an array, or an object. So this whole thing here is an object. And this is an object in the object. So this was a nested object. Um, there are a couple of strategies um, how to relate data to one another. For example, tags is super easy. Everything that's a tag, everything that's like just a couple of strings that, that defines this, um, this object or this document better or um, that you need to store to that document as a tab, as, a, as an array. You can store numbers, strings, or objects. You can have object arrays as well. Um, nested objects is basically, a, this would be an array. So this wouldn't be public, it would be 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, depends on, on how you need to define the data and how you want to access the data later. If you want to say, okay, I'll give me all startups from Barcelona and give me them in an array with just like 10 startups. Then you use an array here, otherwise, if you want to say specifically, okay, I want startup.bitnik, then you do it with an object or uh, with an object, with an object. 
Um, episodes? Episodes for eight. No, we can use the date format. Um, I think JSON date. There is a specification for JSON date. Um, I usually use Moment.js to store dates as a string and then, um, yeah, populate it on the screen. Uh, I function, function, no, I function as a, uh, can you store a function, a uh, JavaScript function, like in one week? I don't know. I don't know. Um, What's also important here, as I said, there are a couple of strategies. Like, if it's really a good idea to put the startup scale right in the document, because with how to do documents, there's one um, one problem. When you want to change some data, when you, you want to change the state or something, you have to retrieve the whole document, you have to parse the JSON, you have to change the state, and you have to put the document back, you have to replace it on the server. So depending on how big your documents are, this can be a huge operation. If you have if you have your application server and your database apart from each other, that's not a huge network network operation and you don't want to do that every second. So it's a good idea to split up these documents and say, okay, yeah, cities and their startups, for example. And so every startup is basically just this part, small document, easy to change, and then your city is under that. And you basically just uh, have a have a city ID in the startup which relates to the city where it is. That's for example a relational strategy that you have um, an ID, basically you store the ID as it is, for example called city Barcelona, and you can retrieve every um, every relation labor that you use. I'll show that. How do you interact with this data? Super simple. That's the cool part. Like, you only retrieve the document and you go to city type. I want the city type, I want the tags, I want the tag number four, or I want the tag back of a specific object. You just go through with uh, the points and just get whatever you need, change whatever you need, and put it back. So, where's the select and all that? There's no select, you would work with, with views, map reduce functions. Uh, the one cross space are going to be either in JavaScript or Ella. Ella views are much faster than JavaScript views, but I've never written one. I have no idea how they work. Um, and spatial views. Spatial views are for the geolocation queries, which is kind of a cool feature of the space. I think I'm going to do that too. What does a view look like? Um, this is a very simple view. You define basically, this is also just a string that is stored to define documents in the database. Another kind of best, best practice that you, for every kind of document that you define in the database, if it's a city, a startup, a user, or something, you can <coughs> a JSON type. And it's kind of like the discipline of the programmer to always use JSON type in the documents so you know what, what document it is, make it fit with the bigger list. And here I say if the document type is city, then you emit the type on the tag block. How does it look like when you call the view? I have three, three cities in the database with Barcelona, Berlin, and London. And uh, the tagline and also always ID, key, and value. The trick here is um, it took me some time to understand that you're not working with IDs here. And that, that the key is not equal to the ID. So basically, this is your key. And you can, you can have an array of keys, and you can change the key as you want. And you can by key. So it doesn't have anything to do with an ID. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a bit tricky in the beginning, but once you understand that it's not the same, that you have IDs and keys and you can use both to work with, um, it's actually quite powerful. So if I want, for example, all tabs that are available for all cities, um, as a kind of more complex view, you can use with JavaScript functions like for each. Asynchronous going through all the ties through all the cities and just showing them in a list. So it's like this. So it says first type beach, first type, second type, one day, full, another. It's actually sorted by uh, alphabetically, automatically. 
um, depending on your order and the key. So the first key is always a sort order, then the second key, then the third key, and then the value. The value is always a lot. Here I didn't define any um, what's the key here? The key is a tag, so it sorts by tag, but it goes right off the tag at first. So these was the first one, and then done and okay. How do you joins? Um, I think I should show you the data in the thing. That's for example another the city the city example again. Um, and I defined a couple of startups here. This is what I said like by defining an ID that you define by yourself. You can do everything on your own. You can just fantasize and get crazy about whatever you want. Uh, you you basically create a relationship. And this relationship you can get with views with a join function or by creating a join function. So here I get all startups first by city, ordered by city, with an additional sort order one, and then the title of the startup. And here I get all cities with a document ID that's, um, that has changed in the, in the latest build of CouchBase Server 2. And before it used to be dot um, period underscore ID, but they took all the metadata out and it's now called metadata.id, which is quite useful because there's like um, some information like the, the version number, the ID, expiration, and all these things are we're in the document, and when you change something there, you kind of messed up the whole thing. So now you can't see it anymore, it's all in meta information, and it's kind of out of the way. So you have the meta ID here, and another sort order. This is a common trick um, with views to sort data. So here I want first the first thing that is about all cities, and then for each city, I want this to start up so I end the city. So this is going to be the first one. First port, uh, first so far, this is the second, and both are outputting the, the title. So it kind of looks like this, you get Barcelona first, the city of Barcelona, the name, then the startups and Barcelona, but then second, the second Barcelona. This is zero one, it's the thing that you manually say to to explicit if you're using the first part or the second part of the right? Yeah. Why, this is, why do you want this? Why do you want the zero? Okay. It's just um, to, to separate the data, to know if it's a city or if it's a startup, and to also get it right away in the right order. You could, for example, do, um, do two separate calls. You can first call all the cities and then call all the, the startups for a city. You can do that asynchronous. You can first like, Give me a list of all the cities and then ask them to go through all the cities and get, get the startup for them. That would be the better way. Um, but this is just for example, so you can get one big view with all cities and by city, every city has a couple of startups and then the next city. So that's why you use zero and one. Instead of zero and one, you could just say city or startup, right? Just there. Um, so you have to be an You could use a string, but then you have to be careful with the alphabet. With the alphabet. That's why you use the number, it's just easier to say, okay, but zero that was the first one, one is the second, two is the third one. You can start by with ten if you want, but um, just to give you the idea, okay, that's that's basically the sort of order. Um, you don't have to be careful with, with alphabetical order. The last function or the last feature for views, which is quite powerful, is map reduce. Like first there was the map import, map data, emitting data. This is the group. It's a super simple function. I don't want to go too, like, too far into, into the use functions today. Um, 
but just counting all startups in, in Barcelona, for example. <coughs> This would output if you, if you just put the count function in as, as a um, reduce function, you get basically this. Can be useful, but not always. So there is a, a parameter that you can add to the URL or to the request as a, as a um, JSON parameter, which is group level. And at the group level, you can define how deep it's going to be into the key. So group level zero means it takes. It takes nothing from the key, it takes all data. Group level one will separate the first key. Group level two will separate the first and the second key. Three will take the first, the second, and the third key. So if you have, like, for example, an array of five keys, you can, with this group level, define by how much it should be reduced or not. So you can get, in the end, you can get four different, um, four different calls, four different queues, which are pretty different data. It's kind of useful when you have like spawn functions or something. You start with a you know, basic list of group level one, so you get only Barcelona and Berlin. And then you have group level three if somebody responds to this, so you can get more information on um, it. There are other, other um, pre built functions for it uses sum, for example, average. So, um, yeah, you can play around with them, but it's, as I said, it's quite complicated method. So, just to give you a short, short idea of, of how it works. <coughs> the second part of the couch space is Mantash D. Yep. All these views have to be stored in the database before being used, or you can use Yes, you have to use like, in couch space, um, it works a bit different than couch D. Um, you have a development area for views and you have a production area for views. So you start in the development area, you create your views, and once they work, you can copy them to production, and then you can use them in production mode. Um, but you have to define them first, and then also the touch based views are stored on disk. So the whole result of a view is stored on disk for indexing. Um, it's also important important feature slash bug of Couchbase um, that the queues are always stale. That means if you enter new data, the queues will still be old until somebody calls them. So the default function for queues is um, update after. So once somebody calls a queue, it gets updated, put it the disk, and the next call will be refreshed. So it's kind of tricky when you, when you develop, for example, with user data or something, real-time data, um, you have to make sure you add stale um, false to always get memory memory information and not disk information. But uh, usually it's, it's, you should call it from disk because if you, are, if you have large indexes and stuff, um, it's better to call it from disk because the stale, it basically calls the whole view, regenerates the view, and that can be quite memory inefficient. Memcache is the second part, the second technology that is integrated in Couchbase. Uh, I haven't actually used it yet, so I can only probably tell you the basics what it is about. Um, it's basically a session, the, the key value store, kind of like Redis. I don't know if you know Redis, it's also an SQL database uh, for the key values. So you have a super fast storage here. But it only works with key value. So you can store 250 uh, characters for each key, and you can store JSON objects or complex data or, or lists or anything. It's basically just you have a key and a value for it. So what should we do with it? You can, for example, work with stock exchange data because, for example, Redis does 150,000 operations per second. So. That's quite the same here with Couchbase, 150,000 operations per second. That's good enough for a stock exchange market, I would say. Game states, if you have good multiplayer games, for example, Couchbase, a uh, big partner of Couchbase is Zynga, the world's biggest Facebook gaming platform. Um, they use Couchbase and they use Comcast D just to, to 
have their memory cache, their big states, and all that stuff, foreign world, whatever, um, they store it there. Um, then you act, they actually need those, those access rates. And for example, if you have a session for the web uh, site or something, <coughs> Node.js is for the session or this uh, Ruby on Rails session or whatever session you have, you store it there and you can retrieve the information quickly. So as I said, 250 characters is the max. You can easily set a key, get a key, increase keys, must um, all these super fast operations. Um, what you can do with it is just, for example, storing user ID, storing ever changing data. Like right? on the website, if the user is <coughs> new and you want to know where the user is at the moment, and you're not, you don't want to know what happened in the client, but you want to also want to store it on the server. Or, on the or to bring the, kit, bring the user back to the last page or something, you can store it, things like that. As I said, for the gaming, you can, you can store gaming information there. Or the session data, or if you if you work with CouchDB, um, you can store your user IDs there, so you implement the user ID every time you uh, store the user. These are the things that you do with Couch with MemcacheDB. So this, this restriction of 250 characters, you mean for the key or for the value? For the value. Seriously? Yep. That's MemcacheDB and CouchBase stuff. Uh, in CouchBase. In MemcacheDB. But MemcacheDB is. I'm pretty sure they use MemCacheDB's bigger values outside of CouchBase. Okay. I know you get me. Well, I looked, I looked on the original MemCacheDB project and they also say it on the computer. That's for the key, not the value. Yeah, exactly. That's where I see the value. But the key makes sense for the values. So we have a lot of cash. Sure. Yeah, and you need to use the value. Okay. I'm not ready for the value, but okay. So. Okay, um, let's see something. So I'm not going through the setup process because it's actually a super simple three-click installation. You start the server, you download the server package, if you have more OS, OS 10. Drag and drop it to the application folder, start it, it will present you with, uh, go to this website, um, it will present you with, um, with the welcome screen, what you want to do, ask you for a username and password. Um, it's pretty hard to change the password afterwards, so make sure you don't use your standard password or something easy there, because, uh, yeah. It's terrible to change afterwards. I'm just going to mirror the screen to make this otherwise. It's So this is how a normal tester looks like. It basically, it's just one node. It tells you also um, <coughs> server nodes. <coughs> but you can't do a failover work if you only have one node. So um, if you have a second node, it will tell you as a second server um, the failover status and how the how the data is balanced and all that stuff. But if you do that, It will tell you basically a lot of information about the buckets, what's, what data is in there, what's a bucket. Uh, it's basically a database. It's, yeah, it's like a collection in Mongo. I have no idea what collections in Mongo are. I, don't know. I guess it's, it can be compared to MySQL database. Right? You have the server and you have the database, you have a couple of databases, and here it's the same, you have the server and you have a couple Buckets and new buckets. And, um, yeah. When you when you connect from a station <coughs> server, you can select which bucket you want to. So I think it's basically the same. Um, okay. 
when I thought I was a programmer, because uh, Dr. Donald and Melody, I'm not a um, so we have basically the whole return information about the database. It's sometimes pretty useful, especially if you do tests and stuff, um, to see are the documents coming <coughs> in properly, are the ground documents getting deleted properly, properly, how many operations per second do you have on to get some idea about the scaling also, like if you have a small backlog, how many operations can you do on a small backlog, and then you can properly that to, to see how much you're going to get from the email for the 500 top megabyte storage. Just to get an idea of what's possible, we can use these features. Um, that's basically the only thing I, I use sometimes is this view, the other stuff, I have no idea what's about. It's more for system administrators and database administrators, but as a developer, you kind of sometimes need this view to also see how many items are there. Um, <coughs> It doesn't tell you too much, but it's enough as a developer to see what's going on. And you see that everything is operational. This is the most important view, like the most important two pages are the data packets and the tools. Because here you can see the documents and you can manipulate the documents right away. So I have six documents here, like we did in the afternoon. Let's go to the link, by Barcelona. Same example as you've seen already. Cool thing is, I can just go ahead and change stuff here. Let's say that I think it's stored in the database and will be reflected by the way for the application. And you can also delete the stuff right away. The views, because are some views that I created. To, to demo the, the things we've seen in the presentation. So let's go to output. This is the uh, development area for views. So you will spend quite some time there when you actually develop the code space because you, you can put a lot of intelligence, pre intelligence into your views to make it easier for the application so we can deal with the data. Uh, that's, Quite important sometimes to, like, as you do it with the select, you don't do select star, you do select this, this, and this, and you try to get as much data as possible. But this is kind of the other way around. You get the first batch, and from the first batch of data, you get the second batch of data, depending on what you did. So you can, you can decide at this point if you want to have big views, big data transmissions, or if you would rather select small parts and get the other batch later if you need it with <coughs> Asynchronous um, calls. So this is one of the lazy views. Basically, it gives you full list of full list of cities. As you can see, JSON type city and make everything. Uh, important with the development area of views is it doesn't use the whole um, the whole data. There's a small <coughs> subset of data usually for development. There are a couple of documents in there. But don't use count or anything on these documents because it's not a full data set. So you have to copy it first to production, and the production views are actually the ones that are stored on this. The development views are still in memory. Um, also, pretty nice is that you can here preview documents. So when you design a view, you mostly design a few based on a, separate, on a single document. For example, um, this view is basically the city names or city information. So I want to see the city document right away to see what, what I'm dealing with. Um, either you hit preview document a couple of times until you, until you find the right document you want to you analyze and you want to write it into, or you have the, the right document ID. It used to be a field probably the screen is too small. Usually, here's a field where you can put the ID of the document in, say, look up ID, and then it will show you the document right here. So this is the major information, like tax expiration. You can set expiration keys for LGB documents. So um, you can say, okay, this, this document expires in 30 minutes, which is sometimes pretty handy, especially for sessions and stuff like that. You don't want to keep them in your, in your database all the time. Um, 
and they get deleted on a regular basis, not in real time though. So if you, if you expect the document to be deleted in 30 minutes, you're wrong. But maybe it's the next day or something. Or if the document is requested. Once it's requested, it seems expired, and we'll tell the client, sorry, it doesn't exist anymore. So where does the ID come from? From the today, you define it, you say. Yeah. When you create a new document, you have to set up, you have to set mm -hmm. a idea for the document. And if you don't want to, does it generate it automatically? No. In CouchDB, in the original CouchDB, it generates two document IDs and CouchDB is not. Uh, it pissed me off in the beginning because I didn't want to, I didn't want to deal with IDs. Um, <coughs> so what you can do in the application just to write an MD5 or something. Um, but later, when you work further with it, you can actually create smart IDs. Like, you, you set your, for example, you say product, colon, this, colon, that, and you get an impression about the document before you even see it. That's kind of useful sometimes because you don't really need the ID for anything else. So it's just for the user, for the developer to see, oh, it's a product, right away, instead of, oh, cryptic MD5 hash, which is too long anyway, so what should I do with it? So, yeah. Then you go back to the definition view. With the definition view. Yep. So here you have like two kinds of documents or yes. type, which is city and startups. Well, this is a strategy. As I said before, for example, if you know you have more, you have only three startups in Barcelona, then you put them in here, right in the document. If you think it's going to be more than three, then you put them in separate documents. And you can, you can, you can decide on your own if you, as I said, if you want to store them as an array, as an object array, as nested objects. If you want like, to have to do a um, relation, mm -hmm. you have to define for somebody in their link, you find an array with the three startups, and then in every startup you have to say no city by the login. In in one to end relationships, you don't have to define the IDs here. You define them in the other documents, in the startup documents, they relate to the city. So um you when you when you so looking, this, looking to the city <coughs> document, you can know which the startups are from exactly. Them. Yeah, but you get it with a view to say, okay, give me all subs from Barcelona, and we'll look through the startup documents and get them for a the city ID for them. <coughs> and it works the other way around. There's also a strategy that you put an array of IDs in here. Um, if you know, okay, you only have five documents from this, which are linked, you can put the IDs here, or for the dual, dual ID, like dual relationship. Like one to one relationships. You can you can do it both ways. Um, in some sense, in some ways, or, or in some uh, <coughs> examples, it makes sense. But mostly, it doesn't. You have to take care of the integrity, I guess. You have to take exactly. Care. Yeah. And then from the regressions, but you have to relate uh, a lot of documents of one type. Yeah. But for example. One, one good example would be uh, customer data. You have your user, your customer, and you have, a, you have another set of documents with your, which are addresses and shipping addresses. And there are like customers that have the same address or something, and customers that have three shipping addresses. Like on Amazon, you can select which you know, where you want to send to. And this is the, this is the idea of like you, you give an array of IDs of the shipping address. For example, like this user has five shipping addresses, but you can say in the shipping address this belongs to this user only. But you do it from the user to say, okay, this is a shipping address. This would be a use case for to store the ID here, here in the document and not in the other way. Um, as I said, arrays. Because yeah. the design of data is done in the what way is part or do you have to do it in like, you can version the view. Mostly do the joints and views. But the mentality with the work with my restaurant with Couchbase is to do multiple um, multiple requests. So you try not to put everything in one big select statement, 
but I <coughs> get small jumps and get them from the distributed system. So um, basically with, with large space it's easier to do three requests in three servers at the same time than to do one request, one big request in one server. Mm -hmm. that's, that's basically what it does. Like there's a big um, not a proxy, a, a load balancer. Which is automatically with the comes with the system, and you just like yeah, you do one request, it gets load balance to all available servers, all available nodes, and it just gets the data from everywhere. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the idea. So, it's nice to be on the device. Exactly. That's easy. It's good with Node.js. Because you can do, like, with an unblocking, you can do many requests at the same time. And just collect all the data synchronously. Um, yeah, it's still it's still quicker than doing one big select statement from somewhere <coughs> from, that, from that scroll machine. So the, the reduced part or all these queries goes in your application. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the, the final result of the information the goes into your application. application. Yeah. yeah, but you only you don't put the data together. You then put the data as it comes in. But uh, you don't do joints or something. Like if you want to have joints, you you get it from the tree as it is. For example, if you want if you want, if you want all startups from the end, um, you call the view startups from the end. And the select part, like the select star part, you know, the where part of the select statement, is done in the URL in the request. So you have a, an area. Um, the, the views are called the uh, the rest call. So you have an HTTP This is basically what you what you call from every application. This is what you get from every application server. It's just this list of the, this is a JSON object. You, you only work with JSON objects. This is what you get from the database. And you can define um, the where clause in the URL directly. So you tell the database right away that it only starts from the end. How do we do that? You have the key. That's the tricky part with the key again that you can define the where with the key. So. Um, So, <coughs> key doesn't need more ID. But on the key, I have to write capital P and that's small um, d. This doesn't really help us much, so I'm going to take another view. All the information about all startups, but we don't want all the only ones in Barcelona again. So here, then I can say, Yeah, that's the same thing.
problem here is the key is an array. So it consists of Barcelona and zero. So we have to work with the start key and end key. Um, there is another trick that I know how it works in JSON, but I don't know how it works in URL. How to define the end key so you only get keys from Barcelona. Um, what I could do, for example, I'm going to start the query. What you're doing here is basically uh, filtering the, the label. Yeah, I'm trying to filter the field. I just like the syntax is a bit complicated at this point to, to say, okay, I only want this subset. But then I could say, for example, I only want startups from Berlin, and it will only return me the startups from Berlin and not from Barcelona. So you can pass uh, or bind parameters to a query or a view, but you simply make a view and then you filter it, or you can pass parameters. Okay, can you pass parameters to a <coughs> Yes, for example, that's, that's uh, what we do here. We pass parameters. But say you want to filter by uh, all the startups that has this word. That's what you do in the queue, basically. You have to define a new queue with the key of this word that you want to filter by. <coughs> ah, okay. And then that's how you do it here. Um, you have basically, you can filter by key, like one single key, which can give you multiple results. So as, as, as again, it's not an ID, it's a key, so you can define Barcelona as a key. I give you everything, everything Barcelona related. Um, you can say start key, end key to get the range of keys, like Barcelona and Berlin, like everything is start with key. You can do start key, end key, and you can use keys. So I, can, I could say Barcelona and Berlin, and it would only result Barcelona and Berlin. So these are the four options, or three options that you have to filter results. Um, if, you, if you want to have multiple where clauses, you need multiple views. Um, What's interesting here to know is also if these are basically design documents, developing tools are design documents in Cauchy, and these are the set of tools for the structure. Um, you should keep these as small. Right? There should only be one to maximum five views per document. Because when you, when you have like big views with a lot of data in them, as I said, they're stored like this. And you call one of them, and one of them is basically stale, it refreshes the whole document. So it refreshes all of views in this design document. So if they're all really big, it will take a lot of time until all the views are refreshed, and it will take a lot of CPU, CPU processing um, to, to refresh all these views, which is not necessary sometimes. So try to make as much um, design documents as possible. Every, every time a document is changed, all the views affecting that document are a bit different. Or it's, yeah. like an index. it's an index, exactly. So you have to be careful with that index when you want to do uh, refresh and then not. Um, once you have the views, once everything is ready and works in the development, you can copy it to the version. It's called public. So you have it here, it will be stored in this, and it will basically be with the full data set. So here, um, important to know when you're when you're developing an app, Ruby and Rails, Node.js, whatever you do, and you try to connect to the views, and you're developing the views, you won't get them. You only get them in production mode. So when you try to, to call a view and it's only and it's only development, what you need to do for what features it exist for a server or something. So you have to know that they always have to be in production before you can use them. Creating views is blocking, or where can you start using them? Some of them are going to take a while to create. Depends on the data. Um, I never work with so, so much databases, so they showed the demo on the CouchCon, and it didn't look very slow, very slow at all. So you create a view. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. What do you mean by you? 
you have like a million users and create a, a view uh, that affects like it's getting users, like can people keep updating users or adding users while this view is being created? Or? The view doesn't affect anything with the creation or the getting of single documents. The views are separate from from the document, like creating an index in SQL blocks the data. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you can still work with, you can still also get single documents and single documents, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The only problem is like, if you generate a user list, for example, it's not updated, it's not on the, that's the only problem, but you can still work with it. And when it stores it in some kind of queue and then updates it later, or when does the view get updated? Is it always real? I mean, if you have this view, then it takes a while to do it. Normally, as I said, normally it's called update after, so, when somebody calls the queue, it gets updated afterwards. If there's no update, it will just keep it on the desk. But it's async, so you're never sure if it's going to be updated. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's views and data buckets. That's an uncached data bucket. You, can, you can't do anything here. You can't see anything there. You basically see the same statistics that we see also with the, with the coach page, the coach TV bucket, like how many operations per second, how many documents, or how many keys are stored there. Um, you, know, you can't really see anything of the keys with the app with the and so on, or other applications over to access the keys. Um, replication, if you have multiple nodes, multiple clusters, you can easily have a replication here. The log is needed, so you can see what's going on in the server. And here you can set some of the settings you can That's my location. So that's the thing you see with the reduce. That's actually the part where you have the reduce functions here. That's the NAND functions. Um, basically, if country, state, and city are set, and if country, city, and country, state, city, otherwise only country, state, otherwise only country. That's the NAND function. That's the reduce function. So 
It only says 1,400 something. If I remove that conflict. Oh yeah. Um, when you have the two to production mode, you can edit them. You can only edit them if you put that on the phone. So you can say copy to that. And then, for example, take the take the reduce functions out how to get the full the full data set here. Also, you have to press the button twice, update offer. So first time it generates it, it, it shows you nothing, it generates a few in the second time it shows you the data. Yeah. Um, you can load the beer example is new, I didn't know that. The other one is sample data is also a couple of a couple of data sets. So when you install install the knowledge base server, it asks in the beginning do you want to want to install a sample bucket? And um, as you see, there are a couple of views, a couple of data, so you can just play around with it. It's pretty nice. And you don't have to like, be create all the data by yourself. Um, okay. Where can we use the database? Use cases. Things that I built so far with our space, mostly prototypes, like small development things, e commerce system. A whole e commerce system without any SQL, only knowledge base, users, everything. Um, some parts were good, some parts were not so smart. I changed the not so smart parts by right now and, uh, and use them in my new system. So this is kind of like the first try of a really big system that I have or that I was working on. QA systems, like you have. Questionnaires, feedback forms, everything <coughs> that that you have a preset of a preset of questions and you have answers to those. You store the question and you store the answer in a new document later from the users. But you always you present always the users the same the same template. And if they start answering, you can just put in the answers step by step. <coughs> when they when they break or when they abort the process, you still have the answers that they have given so far. And um, you don't have null fields or something like that in the database, and you, you can easily create new templates. So you, you, um, what's an example for that? You have template one, five questions, and maybe you want to have template two with ten questions. Because the user wants something else to select something else in the beginning. So, um, what do you do? You create a new table, but there are questions that are in. For, like basically, you just want to add five more questions to those questions which exist, but they're not always there. But typical failed fail case for us at all, like what do you do? You have either you deal with, it, with it, hundreds of null fields, or you have two databases or two tables, but nothing is really the right solution for it. Um, history databases it was my first project on CouchDB. Um, they're basically, at the moment, they're working with XML. It's a pain in the butt, seriously. So in my eyes, they, they are fine with it. They say that like, when you see them working with XML, like they don't, they're history people. They don't have a clue about technical stuff. They don't have a clue about XML. But they have a, an XML standard, which is 1,000 pages thick. Like 1,000 pages A4, which is their XML standard to define historic documents. And um, I tried to introduce how to do that. It's kind of a hard process, but um, it, yeah, it didn't work out. There were very strong-minded people who stick to XML, but um, it actually worked really good at CouchDB and CouchBase to, to get um, these letters in there to introduce this same standard which they used already. It can easily be from, like, from the maximal to JSON because the, the, the <coughs> merge is really quickly and really easy. Um, get rid of all this data overhead, all this major overhead that you have with XML. Yeah. Fine. Like, 
Not the first time. No, no, that's not what I think. Well, some of you may take a screenshot to a clip called a vision. Okay? Not in the screenshot, in the live demo. I'd say that if you stand for optimistic logic, rather than first. It's part of one of the things I haven't tried out in the first place. I know it exists in the house to me, but I can say it back. I haven't found that video in the house space. It might be possible. Yeah. 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 So, both the other developer and the says see you by this story or talking in this case, so I doubt it exists. But anyway, like a merge from XML to, to JSON to translate is really easy. That can be as quick or make life easier, especially with abuse. Yes, you can do. Mobile commercial system that's my current project. So I'm storing all product data, location information, geospatial views, I do that in Couchbase. I don't do user data in Couchbase because there's so many changes that all the time that I want to get all the document changes and put it back. I do that on a, on a key value store. Uh, social information systems like Teambox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like I did something, something for a company who was supposed to be like a social business internet, but it was done. But I was the only person developing that. So someone I said, okay, I don't want to do this anymore uh, because alone it just wasn't really nice to work with. Such a big amount of work. So uh, it started with timesheets. Timesheets is a super, super good example. Can for the document. You have this timesheet. You can set an expiration date. Like, Okay, I won't need this next month anymore, so by the way, I would like it be next month. But for this month, I need it for another reason. Um, CMS, wikis, perfect, wikis, perfect to store in CouchDB, honestly. With a revision, okay, revision from the whole CouchDB, not in CouchBase, but uh, store CMS pages, HTML, all information in this object. And, uh, of course, gaming with the with the cache and all that stuff, storing all this uh, game states and all that stuff, super high high performance um, data that you need, lots of reads, lots of writes, perfect man cache to make it work. Yeah, from here on, if you want to know more, go to couchbase.com, download the couchbase server, try it out yourself. It's super easy to install, it's super easy with those examples to play around to get an idea of what you can do, what you can't do. Um, these are the persons I recommend on Twitter as Couchbase, Jay Bliss, and, and John. Which are like Jay Bliss and John are both the founders of Couchbase and they feed you by Couchbase stuff. And it's a really cool guys. Uh, Couchbase Models is a new project from Scalable. Um, it's basically a collection of best practices of models of design documents, like design strategies. And of course, the approach base to manual, the sort of manual. Um, there's at the moment not too much information there, they're still working on it, but you can, like the setup and the getting started part works already. Um, the more advanced topics are not here yet. And of course, on October 30th, the coach went to Berlin. That's the closest coach company you can go to. Uh, there you can do a lot of like document design, advanced document design, you can do best practices. Um, they have a couple of use cases, people that use coach based in production, also really big systems um, that tell you how they do it. And like the, the challenges you have when you, when you 
grew up with a million of users. <coughs> exactly, are there any questions left? Yes. Uh, I don't know if I should have cut space with like a host of objects. You said it's like you install the server, and you download the screen, you install it somewhere. You mentioned that you can use the app not the server and but this is a space is not a hosting company. They don't host servers. You can download the server. So when you say add another server, you're saying add another server and the same machine. No, you basically have like for example you can you can have servers in a cloud with Amazon. And you can display it usually on Amazon as on on PC3. That you can have a VPN or a central machine or something, or you can do a VPN or a Ubuntu. You install a Couchbase server, and when you say add a new server, you enter the, the server ID and automatically synchronizes with the next server. So you really add a new machine to it with a new with a separate Couchbase server. You can't run two Couchbase servers on one machine. Mm -hmm. So what's the size like difference? Couchbase and Couchbase. Yes. What's the impact you get? Yeah. Um, okay. Couchbase is a collection of these two open sources. Projects. That's my idea. That's what I think of it. Um, and Couchbase adds professionalism to Couchbase. So it adds. Like an abstraction of mm, No, for me, like Couchbase is good if you have like you want to test stuff, if you want to have an open database to quickly work with documents. Couchbase is cool. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, Couchbase adds the scalability. Because you don't really have that, but you have the reputation in how to do it, but it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. Not always. Um, it has the auto failover, it has this whole system of 50% storage or 30% if you have three servers. It has 30% failover, 30% failover, and 70% failover. And it always gets it from three servers at the same time. Right? This whole failover part, this whole scaling part, the whole um, this should be a part of space that you can It's not going to be uh, It's open source. What? It's open source. It's open source and uh, it's free up to two or three nodes. Okay. So you can start, you can download the development version, you can use it, and you can start with two nodes already right away. If you want to go ahead and have a license fee. And even if they're not as expensive as or even or stuff, I think one of uh, one node is 1500 euros per or something like that. So it's not really expensive. You mentioned that there's like a balancer that can be at some point. Uh, yeah. In the so they're usually proxied by, I read it today, Moxie, I think it's a proxy that, that's been used for touch base. When you come in, you have to do it in different things. So you have the option to be on one port or on one port. Or how it to well, it depends if you need the main cache or not. Like, for example, I set it up today the first time that I set up two buckets. Did you set up the Yeah, you can set up basically the main cache, as if you can set up the buckets and set up one cache to be bucket and one, one main cache bucket. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I did today, and worked fine. You just have to specify the TCP port. That's all. Um, you can, you can separate it by server, that you have one server or one cluster only for members and one cluster for those who need. Or you select a different um, key value strategy that you say, okay, I don't want to use couch space for key value, I want to use Redis. And you use couch space for couch to be documents. So you can get a couple of strategies there that you can use. That's interesting. Can you do partial updates? No. Not to you have to the main update. That's what I said. That's why it's that's why you should should keep your documents small as small as possible. Is there no partial updates? Is it production ready? Who uses it in production?
Uh, do you know some specific like big projects that use it? Um, do you know some specific projects that use it? Um, definitely Zynga a lot. Zynga. They're the main customers. For everything or for the scores? Or? I think they use it maybe for, for most of the stuff, yeah. I don't, they don't tell much, so... Um, they have quite some, some customers. And related to this, how do you do backups? Can you do hot, hot backups? Yeah. yeah. That's like with the, with the failover stuff. It's basically an automatic backup. And when sort of crashes, you still have the machine and you have to still have to take the other But if you want point in time backup? Uh, I think there's a backup system for it, but I'm not really sure I can do that. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the mobile synchronization. Uh, what are the options? Um, right now, today, I, I think they don't have anything production ready right now. Um, because they stopped basically the touch to the single server, the touch to the single server, and uh, TV on mobile was basically only synchronizing, replicating when it comes to the single server. Um, they're working on the on the mobile sync at the moment, I think it's called Hubsync, but I haven't heard any updates from there for a while, so they're still in the You mentioned you did something with mobile, what were you using? That was basically the Couchbase single server with the Couchbase mobile. But um, I think since there's also a strong development in TouchDB, which is basically Couch. HDB and JavaScript kind of. Um, I'm not sure what their strategy is because they're, they're um, advertising a lot about how to touch TV. And I think they could depends of it, but I didn't follow the updates the for a while, so I don't know how far the touch sync is <coughs> and how far the touch TV and the more about what's the third question? I already said it, but I have another. <laughs> uh, maybe it's not just for you, but for anyone who knows both systems. What's the difference between Couchbase slash CouchDB and uh, Mongo? And you said you don't, yeah. you don't have Mongo, but yeah. maybe it's somebody here. The collection. Yeah, well, that means. Yeah, but. Okay. And no partial updates, I guess. But I what, I, what I heard from, from people, Couchbase people, of course, is. Um, Mongo is good for small stuff, for small stuff for, to start, but it's not scalable, not that easy to scale. That's what I heard. Well, I mean, they, you're saying exactly not like it's charging. Like MongoDB and Codebase, you, you mentioned charging, so it's yeah. it how uses the same, like the same uh, approach, like just scaling by charging. Okay. It is, it's been proving, like, it, it works sometimes, but like, of course, we had many problems with you know, choosing the right key. Like some, some machines uh, overloaded. But apart from that, I would say, like, I, I don't know if, yeah, like, MongoDB doesn't have views, like, you, you can use map to views, but you, like, use it, with, uh, yeah, use it real time and it doesn't use uh, all the cores, so it's, it's, it's only using yeah. one of the CPUs, so that's quite bad. That. Uh, also, I think Couchbase, I don't know, but Couchbase has a HTTP interface, so you can, like, uh, yeah, it's 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 yeah, you can like actually like for instance if you go to npm, you can when like you hit the repository, it's actually like some templates over the views. It's and, like the whole thing is a code to be in this notebook. So like you can like build in like views, uh, like HTTP views uh, really easy for your data. That's what it sounds like. Uh yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. No, they're working on it. So that's that's a different thing as well. And basically like the whole like the whole Code view called Mongo. It's like the defaults of Mongo are kind of tricky. So, like for instance, when you write uh, when you write MongoDB, uh, it doesn't it doesn't write into the log. So if it crashes, you just you know, <coughs> write and things like that. Or like when you do an insert, it doesn't return you if it failed or not. It's like it's, uh, MongoDB is like super optimistic and like beating all the benchmarks. But uh, like Code View, I think it's more like safe, not like trying to. Do you know if you can set up permissions? No. Um, from what I learned, 
with cloud spaces that we have in the same environment. We only connect to cloud spaces in the application server, and we don't connect directly. That was also a big mistake with the cloud in the beginning, because it's a very old system, and there's basically no password. And even if there's a witness when the password is sent here, uh, by default you can connect to 11 to 11 port, and you can get and set keys and stuff like that. And you can also connect to the, to the REST design interface without a password, and you can change basically everything without a password. So um, you have to make sure that thing is protected by the outside and only accessible by the application server, and then you do the permission stuff on the application server. I just kept uh, this question one week ago that about uh, the transactions in uh, non SQL database. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you have to update uh, and document a bunch. Does the approach to update yeah. all these documents? And if one fails, uh, what's all the... From, I read some stuff about the memcache part, and it said basically, for example, um, when the user clicks, a, clicks in a game, like steady clicks on, on increase or decrease or something, it won't do every operation on the database. It won't, like, get a set of increases and that's one operation on the database. I assume it's kind of the same with CouchBase, that if there are many operations on the same document, we will just merge them together and write one thing to the other. Yeah, but the problem appears when you have to update not, not only one, yeah. one, you have to update right, or five or, and for example, if you have to update all the Barcelona cities to add a new tag, that was one phase. Um, well, to recover, yeah, that's uh, a good question. That's um, where the territory. <laughs> it's optimistic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it, uh, don't write a banking system with this. Yeah, transactions <laughs> is. Mm -hmm. but, uh, this is a problem of um, SQL databases, has, I suppose. You, you don't have transactions. You, the most you have is an atomic operation on a document. I'd say right in the coach space. Yeah, but <laughs> you usually need a uh, transaction. Yeah, but then you, you have to collect it. In, like that's the thing. Like you, most of these things you have to collect them in the original layer. So that's. Yeah, but it's so common to. Yeah. You, you can have parts of it. It's like if, if you are going to build something for a you, you, you can implement this in a SQL database too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you can have part of your, of your data in a NoSQL database and part of your data in a SQL database. Yeah. And mix. Yeah, we have to problem. But in, in, <laughs> in, in most of the case, like transaction is not used in a situation where like, you have like money involved or like it's like like people. It's usually that you have a bunch of operations mm -hmm. and if you if the last one fails. And then you, uh, the other one, pers uh, the first uh, few uh, operations persist, then your data is going to become infected. And I mean, it's like it's like that. It's not super real. As I said, there's not the good resources in country is meaning this, this kind of question. I would pose there to say, like, from the, from the professionals to get an answer there, um, if it's really critical or not. If you, you really have to make sure all the transactions are complete in one thing. So people just like. Right. But imagine a bank transaction when you have yeah, to. That's what I'm saying. Like, if you do bank transactions, uh, you, you have to sum a property yeah. in a con and another document in another con. But in um, this case, you feel like in this case, you wouldn't take the community edition, you would have a license for cash space and then for seven support. Yeah, yeah. 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 You will need to apply yeah. it for an application. Uh, uh, like, 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 uh, like
Beer, you can go play beer ball. You can go beer with beer. <laughs> <laughs> 